Good evening. Good evening, good, good morning, uh, dear participants from around the world. Um, thank you for joining us in this uh, very unique uh, webinar entitled Green Transition Dynamics of Climate Push and Pull Policy. The conversation today uh, will have three uh, experts that will be talking about uh, policy, uh, climate policy, and par this particular uh, dynamic and the potential of push and pull um, uh, policies that we are going to mention very soon. But before that, let me properly introduce myself. My name is Alex Mejia. I'm speaking to you from Geneva, Switzerland. I am a division director at UNITAR, and I have the privilege of uh, helping lead the uh, CIFA Global Network of 22 training centers that UNITAR um, uh, runs around the world. Um, the CIFA Global Network is well represented by CIFA Jeju in the Republic of Korea. And today, you will also hear some introduction remarks from Ambassador Choi, its uh, executive director, and also a very prestigious career diplomat that we have the honor of counting amongst the team of directors of the CIFA Global Network. So without further ado, let me uh, mention again, in welcoming you to this webinar on green transition dynamics of climate push and, push and pull uh, policies. That as we know, transitioning to a greener economy and society requires a holistic transformation. The international community has already taken uh, some bold steps towards sustainable uh, transition, targeting mainly green technology, environmentally friendly industry, and sustainable transport, cleaner air, but there is still a lot to do. Some regional blocks, and countries have announced Green Deal packages uh, to commit themselves and encourage other parts of the world to join the effort towards sustainable pathways. All of these, of course, is within the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development that I'm sure most of you will know. Now, more specifically, the European Union's Green Deal aims to make Europe the first climate neutral continent by 2050, turning environmental challenges into opportunities that will enable a just and inclusive transition for all. But specifically for Asia Pacific and most relevant for this webinar, I'm happy to say that we also admire the Republic of Korea for its ambitious Green New Deal uh, plan to boost the economy and protect the environment at the same time. Now, all of these is good, there is a lot of work to do. There are um, uh, some challenges that are uh, quite imp important, but um, we have to focus on the role of public policy to bring this to fruition. So we know that governments around the world have put in place um, a number of climate policies already uh, to lessen global dependency on fossil fuel and carbon intensive industries and to stimulate changes in production and consumption uh, pattern. The so-called climate push and pull policies are usually implemented together to maximize the government's drives. As such, dynamics of climate policy measures are believed to help accelerate green transition. Now, what is this push and pull? I'm a, a former government official. I come from Ecuador uh, in Latin America, and I've been a, a unitar for a while now. But I do remember the very important role that public policy uh, brings to society, not only to government, because it gives a framework of what is it that is expected, what is the pathway ahead that we should follow. And in this particular um, uh, uh, set of policies, uh, environmental policies, climate policies that we are discussing, the push and pull uh, policy is quite unique because you see um, the idea is that push are uh, the things that the government will set as that framework, uh, perhaps uh, regulatory measures and other standards that people have to observe that industry has to follow. And on the other side, there are pool policies that entice um, industries and uh, entities and actors to actually embrace these change. Those pool policies can be, of course, financial incentives, uh, subsidies, and the like. So uh, just to conclude, on behalf of UNITAR, in giving you these welcome remarks, um, we have today a webinar uh, that uh, focuses on green transition, especially in the post-COVID-19 uh, pandemic economy and what will happen after. The recovery, as our Secretary General Antonio Guterres says, the building back better in the post-COVID era requires that we understand better this green transition and the dynamics of climate push and pull policy. Uh, finally, uh, for all those of you uh, joining us, I, I invite you to remember 
the learning objectives of this uh, event, uh, which is, of course, first to raise awareness about uh, just inclusive and green transition. Second, to uh, help you understand the linkage between policy actions for successful green transition and achieve the sustainable development goals. And finally, perhaps we postulate that these webinars should uh, help us expand networks and identify partners with expertise to assist governments to improve their practices. With that, uh, again, thanking you for taking this time. It is my great pleasure to now give the floor to His Excellency Ambassador Hong Ji Choi, the uh, Director of CIFAD Jeju. Excellency, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Alex, uh, for your kind remarks. And uh, we look forward to this continuing long-term uh, collaboration between uh, UNITAR and CIFAD Jeju. Uh, they are distinguished speakers and our participants. Good afternoon from Jeju and good morning for some of you. Uh, my name is Song Gi Che, Director of Unitar CIFAR Jeju International Training Center. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's uh, webinar, Green Transition, Dynamics of Crime Efficient Pool Policy. This webinar is organized as part of the webinar series promoted by the CIFAR, uh, CIFAR Global Network and the Division for People and Social Inclusion at UNITAR. Taking this opportunity, I would like to commend the efforts put together by all the organizers and the team behind this event. The global community has experienced abnormal and extreme weather more this year than ever. The flood in Western Europe, wildfire in Australia, and hot summer with longer monsoon in Jeju, or record-breaking events. Climate crisis, climate crisis has been covered more often in the media as well as in scientific journals. In this regard, I believe today's webinar provides a timely and unique platform with a topic that captures the urgency of the issue and the importance of a collective action. Today, the panelists will introduce different climate policies, their impacts, and how they have changed over time to not only mitigate, but also adapt to the climate impacts across the world. To add various voices to, to the topic, CIFAR Jeju also made an interview video to show that there are many people who care about environment and try to do something about it. Following today's webinar, we also organize another workshop session next week for those who want to continue to talk about climate issue and engage in the group exercise. CIPAL Jeju, since 2010, has been providing capacity building support to local authorities in Asia and Pacific region in environmental sustainability, social inclusion, and economic development. To this end, CIPAL Jeju will continue to enhance efforts in strengthening its cooperation by building a solid partnership with UNITAR to build the capacity of national, local governmental office, officials and other stakeholders in implementing the sustainable development goals. I strongly hope and believe this webinar will provide an opportunity for in-depth discussions, knowledge sharing, good practices, peer-to-peer -peer learning, and the lesson learned on innovative practices. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Ambassador, for uh, indeed uh, recommitting uh, the center that you lead in the Republic of Korea uh, to this joint effort that we have at the United Nations as a whole, uh, particularly at UNITAR and at the CIFA Global Network. There is a lot to do indeed, and a lot to understand. And that's why I'm very happy uh, to see that this panel is about to begin. We have three outstanding experts uh, that will be moderated by my colleague, Ms. Julia Genth. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Julia. Julia, please. Thank you very much, dear Alex. Thank you very much, Ambassador Choi. And next up, I would like to welcome our panelists today. Our first panelist is Professor Yang Sung Bu. He is, works at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Kwangkuk University in Seoul, Korea. Dear Professor Sun Vu, 
Um, his topic today will be climate push policy, regulatory influence. And dear Professor Sonru, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Um, do I get uh, the control of the um, screen or are you going to? Um, I will be um, oh, okay. sure and controlling it for you. OK, that? so again, um, thank you for inviting me. It's a great honor to be able to present at this um, webinar. Um, I am Young Sunwoo um, in Kongok University, a private university in Seoul, Korea. Um, I'm also right now the um, Director General of IUAPA, the International Union of Air Pollution Prevention and Environmental Protection Associations. It's a um, union of um, academic uh, societies, um, national societies that are in charge of air pollution. Um, when I was wondering about how to arrange this talk, I looked at the, um, the background, this blurb um, that Unip um, Unifar had um, prepared. And I decided to take some um, key phrases from this background statements um, to make my table of contents. So if you click again uh, for the animation, okay. So this, this is the first time I'm trying this, but actually I'm taking the table of contents from your background statements and I will be um, organizing as a table of contents. So um, if you can click again, and just click through the whole thing until the whole table of contents um, is showing. Okay, so there's five topics that I'll be talking about, one more, okay. So the, and these are all statements taken from your background statements regarding um, the uh, push and pull policies. Uh, obviously, number one is gonna be some background about climate change and um, uh, you, know, you, you can go on and on about that, but I'll just keep that very short. Um, section two will be the climate push policies that I'm in charge of. And basically they are regulatory measures and standards. Um, 20 minutes is what I have um, allocated as um, my speech time. And 20 minutes is definitely not enough to go through all the climate push policies that are um, being run by Europe and other countries. Um, but I'll try to just um, pick, um, take on some of the presiding concepts of what um, especially some of these specific policies are. In section three and the dynamics of climate policy measures, I wanna um, bring, introduce a concept of uh, short-lived climate pollutants that many of you probably are not familiar with, but it's very important, uh, especially recently. And then number four, um, needs to be reflected in all levels of go government policy. I wanna stress again and again, the fact that all levels, all um, the, it's a, it needs a, to be a team effort. Everybody has to be involved and I'm gonna uh, stress that very highly. And then number five will be just that sentence itself. Um, I'll be sort of wrapping up with um, section five. Okay, next please. Okay, next. Okay, um, well, when you talk about background of climate change, you can begin with all sorts of apocalyptic slides of um, hurricanes, um, floods, and you know anything that um, re looks really dire. Um, we know about these um, red uh, maps of high temperatures, we've seen it enough, but I want to show the right below the map, you can see that the fifth evaluation report by the IPCC, um, this was published in 2014, it is clear now that global warming is caused by human activity. activity. When I was first teaching this about 10 years ago in my uh, university, I used to say that climate change was a hypothesis. Okay, it wasn't a proven fact yet. We are very clear on the fact that it is a fact that is caused by human activity. I know there are still some dissenters out there, some people who don't believe this, but all of you who are listening in um, to this uh, webinar, I'm sure you are all into the fact that we are the problem, we are causing this, and we are the ones who can prevent this also. And um, the IPCC also identified on the right-hand side, objectively and scientifically, highest CO2 con concentration in two million years, fastest level of sea ri CO2 rises, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the lower paragraph, you can see that key figure, 1.5 degrees C. Okay, everybody has heard about the 1.5 that we cannot afford to go over that um, temperature um, range. One thing I want you to sort of concentrate on on the last sentence is that, okay, we have a net zero objective. Most countries have an objective by 2050. 
Okay. But there's another level there where it says um, 45% needs to fall about 45% from 200, 2010 levels by 2030. The thing, the concept I want to stress here is that it's good and it's imperative that we reach the goal by 2050, but it's also very important what kind of pathway we follow to reach that goal. Okay. So pathway, it, that term is something that I want to really concentrate on, is that we, it's fine to reach a goal by a certain time, but it's very important on what route we take, what path we take, and that's going to be a very important concept um, of my talk also. Next, please. Couldn't leave out Korea, which is my home country. Um, we're having all sorts of catastrophic uh, uh, climate results, if you will. Um, almost 40 degrees in Seoul in 2018 was all unheard of. We're having high winter temperatures, rainy seasons that last lo very long. But if you look at that last paragraph, um, we have a temperature rise of, of 1.87. It's more than double the global average. So this region, not only Korea, but the Far East Asia, Far East Asia is having a much higher temperature rise than other regions of the world. So um, as you know, it's a global phenomenon. Climate change is a global phenomenon, but the impacts are local. And that's what the public is actually interested in. It's not, when we talk about global things, the people don't really connect that well. But all these um, phenomena that are occurring locally is something that we have to touch on and to try to connect with the global uh, phenomena that we can try to control. Next, please. Okay, there's not only negatives, but positives. And we don't seem to promote this enough, I don't think. Okay, in the UN, um, they have uh, come up with these kind of uh, uh, studies that actually you can have a um, green economy that can have economic gain of hordes of, you know, $26 trillion through 2030. Okay, you can have more jobs that are nature based and clean energy based. Of course, you have to prepare for adaptation. Okay, a certain degree of climate change is going to occur, so you have to prepare also. This last quote by the um, United UN Secretary General, I think we have to keep in mind is that um, obviously the entire globe is recovering from COVID. There are certain things we can do in policies that governments or local governments that we probably can, could not have done if it was if we were not recovering from COVID. Okay, so there are certain advantages to having this kind of recovery period when we're trying to solve the climate problem also. Next, please. Okay, so now I'll um, talk about some themes behind some push policies. Next, please. Okay, obviously Europe is the most farthest ahead. Um, they have a whole um, list of ambitious packages um, that have uh, trying to basically cut down greenhouse gas emissions. That is the key. Okay, but these four items that I've chosen to um, show you that the European Green Deal encompasses has four themes that I think are very important to everybody in all the countries of the world. The first one, climate law. Okay, um, you need some kind of enforcement. You can't just be kind of waiting on the sidelines and waiting for things to kind of happen. The governments have to take initiative and um, depending on certain uh, topics, you have to put it into law. You have to enforce these um, objectives. You have to enforce these policies. The second one, a common theme throughout my talk today is that everybody has to be involved. It's gotta be a team effort, citizens, governments, um, the NGOs, the education, everybody, everybody has to be involved or else we will we'll not reach the um, ultimate goal. The third um, item, again, is the importance of pathways. What kind of route are we going to take? Okay, it's important to reach the 2050 goal or for in China's case, 2060 goal, but it's very important that we choose the right path, an urgent path in these um, Countrywide Green New Deals, that um, the pathway is going to be very important and can't stress that enough. And the last item, again, as I mentioned, um, you have to be ready to adapt. Okay. Um, things are going to happen. The climate has already changed significantly. Um, we're going to have very high, very um, high highs and very low lows, if you will. Um, it's going to happen. We're trying to mitigate 
the pro um, the problem, but it is going to happen. So uh, we're going to have to um, find ways to um, adapt to this situation. Next, please. In the United States, I had to reduce some slides because of the time impact. But again, the United States is the United States. It is important that they, they join this movement. And uh, um, thankfully, um, this new government is much more in tune with what uh, the other countries in the world are trying to do. Obviously, reducing emissions in the middle is the key. The United States has to uh, play their role internationally. They have to advance the science and um, the cost benefit analysis, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. Okay, one thing you can um, uh, try to do is that, okay, thank you for changing the, um, the uh, typo, but okay, federal measures. Okay, this is sort of an example of a push policy. Government has to go forward first. It has to set an example, not only for the government on scope one and where um, the federal agency itself, but um, things that are purchased by the federal agency. For example, the power companies, the electricity that's purchased. And then on scope three, indirectly controlled or indirectly related to federal agencies. All these kind of activities have to be out in the front, setting an example for the public and for companies, because um, the government has to show that they are really earnestly involved in this to set an example for everybody else. Um, Thankfully, the United States is redoubling their uh, climate finance contribution to 11.4 billion. There can be a lot more, but again, um, they are becoming a little more um, close to what we're hoping for. I didn't include China in this, but China made a new statement that they'll build new, um, they will not build new coal-fired power plants abroad. So these kind of activities and statements by governments is very important to pull along um, the public and everybody else. Next slide, please. Okay, some uh, measures that are just the, a sampling of some measures that our um, country, Korea, is doing. Um, these big sources, the first one is for big sources, having an energy target management system. Um, I'm an educator, so I'm very keen on the fact that um, we have programs where we build experts, um, we build manpower, we teach um, climate change, and we have uh, graduate programs that are specializing in climate change. This is gonna be a long-term problem, okay? We need people um, who will be educated in this field. We will need experts in a diverse um, arena of uh, climate-related um, disciplines. And we need to be able to uh, foster these professionals. Um, the advanced countries, R&D projects are very important. And we have this uh, uh, campaign called Green Life Me First. Again, this is important because it involves everybody. Okay, the last sentence in that paragraph, you can see that non-industrial fields, such as home, transportation, et cetera, we need to have everybody involved. Next, please. Okay, in this section of dynamics, um, I'm gonna introduce you to a, uh, a different, uh, maybe for some of you, it's, you've heard it for the first time, but some of you, maybe it's old hat, but it's a very important item. Next slide. Okay, it's called CCA, well, the organization is called CCAC. It's also a UN um, sponsored organization called the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Okay, it's a partnership of governments, IGOs, intergovernmental organizations, and NGOs, international NGOs. And the basic role of CCAC is to reduce short lived climate pollutants, or what we call SLCPs. And you have an example of the SLCPs on the right hand table black carbon, methane ozone, and hydrofluorocarbons, okay? These are short-lived compared to CO2, okay? But um, ozone is a secondary pollutant which is made in the atmosphere, but black carbon, methane, and HFCs, we are spewing, still spewing out in the atmosphere. So you have to be very aware of this. And if you look at the last paragraph, you can see that this um, SLCPs are responsible for 45% of the current global warming. Okay. So you sort of have to wonder why the IPCC wasn't really interested in this a lot sooner. I mean, there's a lot of things that IPCC is, has to um, treat, a lot of politics involved and everything. But this um, IPCC, the 26th in Glasgow, will be paying a lot of attention um, to um, the SLCPs. And I think more of us have to pay attention to these SLCPs. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, the, why is SLCPs important? You can look at that left side. 
CO2, it's got a broad range, but the lifetime is 100 to 1,000 years, okay? HFC is 15 years, methane 12 years, BC and ozone a lot shorter. Now, these materials have a much higher impact. Okay, if you look there in the middle, um, the CO2 based as one, methane has 84 times of what we call approximately the global warming potential. So power to raise the temperature uh, in a layman's terms, okay? Black carbon, 900 times CO2. HFCs, 1,500 times HO2, okay? So if you look at that lower box, it says over a 20-year period, SLCPs are many times more powerful than CO2, okay? Another important thing about these SLCPs is they're also air pollutants, okay? So you can basically kill um, two birds with one stone kind of an aspect, so it's good for everybody. Um, the solutions, black carbon, 70% um, by 2030. This is a study that was done by the CCAC. And um, globally, we think that global black carbon can be reduced by 70% um, by 2030, methane 45% and so on. And it was nice to hear that the United States, EU, and about seven countries had a methane reduction pledge recently to cut methane emissions by 30% by 2030. The okay, next slide, please. Okay, another important thing is this slide didn't turn out the way I wanted to, but I want the message I want to um, give you here is the importance of not having politics too much involved in um, the the green green transition. The example I want to show you here is that um, our president and the um, ruling party right now was very high on solar radiation as an energy source. Unfortunately, we have a very dichotomous kind of a government right now. And the conservative side of the government is very anti-solar radiation because of the fact that it is being pushed by the, um, the government. Now, these kind of political aspects have to be reduced as much as possible, especially for the developing countries. I think it's if too much of these kind of energy issues become political, it will be very damaging. Um, to you know, ha have any kind of trust in um, climate change policies. So I think that's something that we have to be really um, careful of. Next slide, please. Okay, again, the thing I really wanna stress here, all levels of government, all levels of communities, all levels of international, everybody has to be involved. Next slide. The EU obviously is the best example and you can see the, the hordes of um, the areas that needs to be involved. Um, energy, agriculture, industry, finance, I mean, everything has to be involved, right? Um, you can see at the lower left-hand corner that the EU here, at the making of timing of this slide, um, the blue leaves are already presented, the policies have been presented, and the green leaves are upcoming um, in the future. You can see on the energy side that um, we have methane strategy, hydrogen strategy, so they are already involving SLCPs, okay? Um, if you look at the agriculture and food, something that's very popular in advanced countries is the farm to fork strategy. That's the food, like the beef problem that they're um, having. Um, an example of the industry would be zero carbon um, steel industry. Um, we have a very strong steel industry in Korea, and that will be also a very key um, point. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go past this. But again, all these areas that we can be, oh, the last um, thing on the um, bottom left, finance. The government has to be all in, and you have to have an investment plan. You have to have tax um, policies, and also this has to be sustainable. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, you can go on to the next slide. Again, I'm talking to you about an important um, part of what Korea's policy is. And I, uh, again, this is the thing that I'm sort of disappointed about. They have a nice Green New Deal. Um, again, it's a lot of um, talk and maybe a little less action that um, uh, was kind of disappointing, but it was more disappointing that they lumped it together with other things. And that's the point I'm trying to make with this slide. We had the Green New Deal, and then it was lumped together with the Digital New Deal. And obviously, Korea is very strong in the IT industry. And then, but on top of that, next slide, next click. They also decided to add um, the human new deal. Now, this, the reason I don't like this kind of an approach is that the green transition, the green new deal has to be prioritized to the fullest, okay? I'm worried about um, these other branches diluting 
um, the process that we need to go all in on the Green, Green New Deal. Okay. I realize a lot of developing countries, if you're in government, um, you have a lot of other things that you're worried about. Um, and that's un understandable. But this is a stage and this is a time when we have to go all in. And that's what I'm trying to stress with this um, slide. Next, next slide. This is the last statement that I've taken from the um, background um, comments uh, from UNITAR. Understand the climate aspects of the global move on green transition. Now, I, I'm not an English major, but the key word here is green, green transition. I mean, climate aspects, you, you know, climate is like a subset of the green transition set that we are absolutely having to move. You know. Okay, next slide. So my five um, keys to smooth green, green transition, and I'll wrap up with this, urgency, okay? Everybody has heard of NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard, um, environmental uh, um, solution-wise. Um, a colleague of mine talked about now it's NIMT, N-I-M-T, not in my term, okay? The reason climate change problems are so difficult, especially for you and government, is the fact that the solutions are something that um, will be, uh, the problem is not gonna solve itself within the term, within a an, an, uh, public official's reelection term, for example, okay? That's why it's very difficult to convince the urgent aspects of this um, uh, transition and the, to go all in. And again, I talked about pathways, so I'll skip that. Efficiency in a priority scale means what every country has to set as their priority. This is gonna be different from country to country. The United States is not gonna have the same priorities as Indonesia, for example, okay? You have to set your own priorities in your SDGs and you have to solve your own problems and set the right priorities for yourself. Communication, I cannot stress this enough. It's gotta be an all out team effort. You have to convince the public, the NGOs and everybody involved, even other divisions of the government. And the, the, to have the correct communication skills to do this, I think will be for, in many cases, a um, make or break kind of a deal. Of course, um, international cooperation, the relationship between um, OECD countries and developing countries, and even um, webinars such as today, I think will be a big part of um, helping in this international co um, cooperation. Thank you for your time. Thank you so very much, um, Professor, for your incredibly valuable and interesting um, intervention. I certainly myself have learned a lot um, from your presentation, and um, I thank you so very much for your contributions and your time today. Next, we would like to welcome our next panelist, Mr. Mushtaq Memon. He's a regional sub-program coordinator for the Resource Efficiency at UN Environment Program Asia and the Pacific Office. His topic today will be climate pool policy and the market pressure. Dear Dr. Medan, your the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, uh, colleagues, and especially His Excellency uh, Hongi Choi and my friends from Sepal Jeju. So let me start uh, to share my screen. Okay, you have. So okay, then you can. So. As today we are looking on the market pressures, uh, I want to really come with the understanding for what market pressures and how we can get the pull policy. So next slide, please. So if we start the markets, the markets are all about the resources, that how the global resources are being extracted, produced, utilized, and what is its relationship with the climate? And that is very important to understand. And as the UNEPS uh, uh, hosted global, uh, this resource outlook re report shows that we are inefficiently using the resources. That means we are creating more harm to the climate rather than getting advantage of the natural resources we have. Next slide, please. So if we look on this, the impact of this resource efficiency or so on, if we look separately, like uh, impact on the water, impact on the climate and so on, or the land use and so forth. So if we look separately, still there are very high impacts, but if we combine, if we take the snowball effect that suppose the climate change creates the droughts, creates the water shortages, 
And then again, the water contamination or shortages from the resource uh, uh, inefficiency use and so on. So basically we are creating much, much bigger impact than those individual impacts, which you are looking at the screen now. And then UNEP point in 2010, the work that about the decoupling, that how we can decouple our economic growth from the environmental pressures, including the climate uh, impacts. And that is very important to look on this decoupling of the well being, decoupling of the resources, and so on. And that is how we are coming to create the market pressures, basically, for generating that decoupling impact. Next slide, please. And for that, if we putting the climate change in the context, as we saw in the latest report from Alan MacArthur, that 55% of the climate mitigation is related with the energy and 45% is with the products and especially the resources, uh, metals, uh, my, uh, I mean, minerals and uh, biomass and so on. So again, when you look on the both energy and products, it's all about the private sector that you look on the any value chain, whether it be the textiles, whether it be the plastics, whether it be the automobiles, whether it be the food and so on, you will see the private sector engagement from extraction or production of the raw materials to the production and even to the major consumers, to the even to the maintenance and even to the end of value like uh, recycling and recovery and so on. So basically, how you bring the private sector on board vis a vis resource efficiency to reduce the negative impacts on the climate change. Next slide, please. So the first thing you look at that, the different countries have a different levels of resource efficiency. And if you look on the center of the slide, uh, I'm sorry, this is heavily populated, but let's just focus on the center down at the bottom. And you can see the Mongolia has a 18.39 means inefficiency level, while Japan is a very small dot in the 0 0.001. That means in Mongolia is basically on the primary resources like mining and so on. So the resource efficiency for the GDP, $1, is quite huge inefficiency, while in Japan, it's quite low. And if you go a little up, you see that in Asia Pacific, 50% of the resources are used for only 32% of the global economic uh, GDP or so on. So this means you have a very clear idea that on the one hand, our region, Asia Pacific per se, is not at par in the resource efficiency, and more important within the region, there are a lot of differences across the countries. And that is where you can see that the private sector, suppose in Mongolia in mining, the private sector, suppose in the car industry in Japan. So how you are really bridging the gap of resource inefficiency per se, whether it be the energy sectors, whether it be the product sector, that is the very important point. You create the market pressures for bridging that gap through the technology transfer, through the incentives, through the uh, financing mechanisms and so on. And including the you know, ESG, environmental, social and governance investments and so forth. Next slide, please. Now, another interesting point is that Asia Pacific region is a high on the mass consumption. Why? Because of the middle income. As we see the economic growth, we have a middle income, and that is very high on the mass consumerism, and that's really short-lived products. Uh, for example, mobile phones, even the if you look on the food waste, you look on anything. And that is why even yesterday I was looking at that uh, one article and which I used to like acquire that idea that uh, sometimes the branded goods it could be a better option because then you buy once in your lifetime your bag, Louis Vuitton, and you live with it rather than you are every day using a, a separate shopping bags and so on. So the whole point is this mass consumerism is putting a lot of pressure on the uh, extraction of the natural resources 
the consumption and dumping that end of life products back into the environment. And that is a huge. So if you look on this uh, climate change across the waste value chain, it's a huge. It's not only about the landfill gas or the, as the professor was mentioning about the CCAC, the methane emissions and so on. But if you look on the whole value chain, if you reduce the waste, you are basically reducing the also the landfill gases per se. And also you are reducing the CO2s from the extraction, from the production, from the even the, so that's where this whole idea of shared economy and so on is coming into the play. And again, coming back that Asia Pacific with this whole mass consumerism is one of the major challenge where the market pressures can be really useful. Next slide, please. So here, when we talk about the market pressures, you look on the economic benefits because you have to create the incentives or disincentives in a way for the market pressures. It's not only the matter of awareness raising because if the people have choices, if they are different cultures, like source segregation is a widely different in different countries despite of many efforts all over the years. So whole point is that at how you create the economic benefits or disincentives to create the market pressures through the regulatory frameworks. That is the starting point I would call. It's very, very important to look into that. And then also like SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. So if you look on the, all the indicators from the resource efficiency moving to the sustainable public procurement because that's another market pressure because governments has a huge public spanning uh, in developing countries and where they can really create this uh, uh, pull effect. And then there's a sustainable lifestyles and so on. Then also comes the, in uh, SDG 12, the tourism. And as we see Asia Pacific has a huge impact because of the tourism as it's evident in the COVID situations as well. So that is another pull factor there. So we can look on those policies to see how we can create this. And then comes the capital investments. As we see, the region has seen a huge green recovery, stimulus funding, and so on. So there's a lot of capital investments in the region coming up, going on, and how you take advantage, how you align that to create the market pressures along with the sustainable public procurements and so on. Next slide, please. So looking on this stimulus packages, as we see that uh, Asia Pacific in the green recovery is still much lower in terms of a total stimulus packages is around 15%, while the global like uh, average is at 21%. And we see that some countries has a huge like uh, Japan, South Korea, China, but then either we do not have a data for uh, many other countries, or the spanning like Australia is not yet for the climate oriented market pressures and so on. Next slide, please. So when you're looking on this market pressures, this concessional climate finance is a very, very critical point to look into that. And that is where we have looked back that uh, this COVID-19 uh, is a sort of a blessing in disguise because this gave us a second chance because in a way we stopped everything and now we are rebooting and recovering and so on. So this gave us a time to really look back that what we can do the things with when we had no chance to stop the wheel, but COVID stop literally the wheel and then we can restarting the whole wheel. And that's where these are some of the examples there that how these pressures are being created for the green recovery. And especially like in South Korea is a very important country to learn from this green recovery. Next slide, please. And then there are some of the tools which you know always like uh, uh, has been hosting and supporting and capacity building. Uh, for this, again, the market pressures. So as I said, that life cycle approach, this is very important to learn whole value chain to see where the market pressures can be optimized uh, because at the same time, we do not have resources. We may not have the whole value chain so we can identify the hottest spots where we can put the pressures to start with. 
eco innovations is another important point and especially again with covid even you see the story of moderna that how this pioneer, uh, pioneering uh, in uh, uh, cambridge in usa they came up with this vaccine so this eco innovation for environmental purposes the green startups and so on are becoming very very important and as a youth in the audience today i would really uh, support you to go for the eco innovations then consumer information as we have seen that in europe there's a lot on the consumer information even this farm to fork like a strategy and so on basically all this goes with the consumer information and in asia pacific i think we need to support this that all the products all the transparency are there than the labeling and so on so then we can also look at the sustainable public procurement i already talked about and then the sustainable lifestyles because of this mass consumerism in our region this is the most important last but not the least and even uh, we are launching uh, with a scap and untart the environment and trade publication this year is focused on the climate that how this regional agreements can help to push the pressures through the trade policies like uh, suppose the eu green deal they are trying to push the carbon uh, border carbon mechanisms to have a fair play for all the producers and so on so we can see that how this regional agreements on trade can really help for the climate uh, related market pressures next please next slide please and just uh, quickly now as we have to really go down to the drawing board to identify the important market pressures as i say we can't have uh, like uh, so many things at the same time we have to be really really strategic we prioritize so you look on the whole value chains of uh, different products or energy sector you look on the different stakeholders including the uh, producers the consumers uh, the regulators and so on and then you can look on the different ways so this is an example from the plastic waste that how the policies how the management like a financing technology or the business models how the social and uh, political behaviors uh, based on the knowledge attitude and practice can help and you can select the important market pressures across the value chain next please next slide please so again uh, sorry so again this uh, for the market value chain as i say that you start from the eco designs you can have a green supply chain and especially with the covid because of the challenges with the global supply chains and all these container ships and issues you can really look in the local green supply chains share, uh, sharing platforms including the car share uh, office share and so on and extended product life instead of a mass consumerism you have a long long lived products and so on then product as a service instead of buying the bulk you uh, get the lighting as a service as we receive this uh, big bottles for the water at home and they are like a shared bottles and so on then at the end of day also we should have a green recycling and recovery next please next slide please and last this important point is that i think we should take advantage of the modern technologies as we have been really pushing to the limits our engineering or conventional technologies in, including from extraction to the uh, production to the end of life we have to have digital including the qr codes to really tap back systems and so on so this is important last slide next please and quickly the legislators i think they are very very important the parliamentarians that uh, they have role not only on the policy making but also on the budgetary and oversight next please and some of the those roles i already put it here but again for the market pressures whether it be the public investments uh, taxes incentives uh, green procurement and so on so how this legislation but more important is budgets like a care versus cure suppose you invest in the climate change to reduce your investments in the healthcare because you reduce the impact on the health through the improved climate change policies next please so finally we have to work together it's not about the government it's not about the private sector it's not only about the consumers and so on so i think it's a partnership is a very interactive partnership to come through 
for this full policy to really make this world a better place to live. Next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Minam, for your wonderful presentation and also for um, showcasing what UN Environment Program is doing in the Asia Pacific region um, for the um, policies. So thank you so very much for your contribution. It was very valuable. Next, we would like to welcome um, a staff member from UNITARM, Mr. Angus McKay. He's the director for the Division for Planet at UNITARM and he will be speaking on perspectives on just transition. Dear Mr. McKay, the floor is yours. Thank you, Julia, um, <clears throat> and thank you, friends and colleagues. Now, Julia, I'm going to ask you to take the, the slide off the screen, if you don't mind, and um, can I actually uh, be on, on camera? That's right. Let's have a, a bit of human touch. That's fantastic. I'm going to be slightly annoying, Julia, because I've got a few slides, but in between, I, I want you to put us back on screen so that we can we can see each other. Um, very good. Well, first of all, my congrats to Sifal Jeju. We've had some exchanges with you in the past. I've been to Jeju a couple of times. And in fact, I have the privilege of being part of a British Korean family. My, my two children are half Korean. Um, and to benefit hugely from, from all of that 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 means uh, in this world. So that's great. And Alex, uh, you know, we work together a lot closely, and uh, we share these spaces. And it's a, it's always a great pleasure to work with you. Um, I work at Unitar Friends because I believe that we need to do more to build global literacy in in on climate change in particular green economy, circularity, which has just been evoked by the, the previous uh, speaker. Um, and, and the reason is because, it's very simple, is that we're only going to be able to unlock the full innovative potential of humanity if, you know, if, if we educate. Um, and you know, never before have we needed that full innovative capacity of all of humanity, all of those ideas to be channeled into addressing the challenges um, that we're up against today. Uh, so, so that's really my, that's why I'm here. Um, and, and I've been in many other places. I'm a geographer by training and I started out, we you know, working in wildlife and worked for the UK government for many years, worked for the World Bank, UNDP. UNITAR is where um, I think I can make the most impact and it's because of this this whole issue of, of building literacy to unlock uh, potential what i'm going to do is talk a little bit about this issue of just transition i i'm not the world expert on this but it it's it's a concept just transition that has been in the sort of development lexicon now for some time and i i do think we should all have a better understanding of what this means although i'm pretty sure there'll be a spectrum of views um, on what it means. So I'm going to set the scene on what it is, why it's important, and we're going to try and have a quick poll, Julia. Julia's going to do a quick poll. We're going to ask you to put some ideas in the chat box on what you think Just Transition is all about, and maybe we'll get some innovation uh, from that exercise. And then I'll close with some, some thoughts on the effects of COVID um, and where we go from there. But let me, you know, start by saying, I, you know, I've made, a, I've been scribbling notes during the first two presentations and they're both absolutely excellent and I I'm relieved to see that my messages are going to align with much of what's been said before um Professor uh, Sun Wu it was, it was great pleasure listening to you and I you know you talked about building manpower absolutely we also talked about having to go all in this is the moment um and um, many other things as well I mean you know it's a team effort everyone should be involved and um and, and Mushtaq we, we've I think we've We've been on platforms together before, um, but it's a great pleasure to to hear you talk about inefficient use of resources and so on, which I'll come to, amongst many other things, innovative ideas that you presented. So, uh, in terms of uh, perhaps we can not qu quite do the poll just yet. Um, it's, it's flashed up on screen. Well, I'll, I'll I'll indicate when. Uh, so yes, just transition. It's become part of uh, development speak, um, but it's worth reminding ourselves what it means. Transition to what exactly? Uh, well, it's about transition to a global economic system that is more equitable, responding 
to SDG 1 on poverty eradication, but also delivering on these, these green SDGs as well that we've already spoken about uh, this uh, previously and starting with SDG 13 and the whole issue of achieving carbon neutrality. And here, Julia, is where I want my first slide, because the reality is that at the moment, our global economy looks a little bit like this. Uh, this is um, an extractive uh, economy. And if you look at the date line at the bottom, you can see it runs from about 1970 through to 2017. I got this, by the way, um, um, from Stephen Stone from UNEP, those of you who work closely with UNEP, um, and in it's one of his stock slides. And what it shows is that we are uh, using um, global, we're extracting materials like never before, about three times as much as we were back in 1970 is being pulled out of our system either in relation to fossil fuels or, or, or metals or, or biomass, you know, through our forests. So we're using up this um, environmental stock and it's increasing. And then if you look at that little line, um, the black line, it, that's the material productivity, which we've just been talking about. And we can see that, you know, 1970s and 80s, in fact, our productivity, meaning the amount of sort of output per unit of, of, of raw material extracted was actually increasing. We're doing quite a good job. But in recent years, it's dropped back down again, um, you know, to some extent because uh, through in industrialization and increased demand in middle income countries, newly industrialized nations and so on. So, so it's a pretty extractive um, and bleak picture. And it's uh, what we call a linear economy where you extract, you transport materials, sometimes over you know, very long, long large distances. Um, you then produce goods, they're consumed, and then they're disposed of. And at each stage in that process, as we that well know, um, carbon is generated as well as other pollutants and, and emitted. So Julia, you can sort of take that one down now. Um, but um, it, you know, it's it's it is it is a useful one to consider, and it and unfortunately does describe rather closely the system that we are living under and have lived under, despite all the great words um, and ideas uh, that are in in circulation at the moment. There's no question that this extractive system has worked in many ways for humanity. Um, you know, it has produced many many benefits. Um, but it isn't a long-term solution, and this is the time when we have to change the system. So then the question is, are we changing? Uh, and here, there, there, there's always good news. There must be good news in seminars like this. And in the UN, we are about um, ideas and hope. Uh, we're, we're not about the, the doom and gloom, that's for sure. Um, but it is genuine uh, that, that there's good news. We've come a long way since the somewhat shall we say, hedonistic days of the, of the 1980s when I was growing up and, and the 1990s when I was building my career. Um, and when I entered the job market, this will be the same experience for many of you, um, it was perfectly acceptable, indeed normal, to make career choices based purely on the idea that I'm going to accumulate resources, I'm going to get rich, right, over my career. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get rich for myself, for my, for my family, for those around as a, a matter of, of status. And this was fine. And top companies offered high salaries, nice cars, bonuses. And that at the time was enough to attract some of the best people and some of the best minds. Nobody particularly thought that was a bad, a bad thing. But I think this has definitely changed. I think this attitude has changed. I think this view of the world and your role in it as an individual is being seen as increasingly unsophisticated. Um, Environmental sustainability is now part of our everyday language. It wasn't in the 90s, 70s and 80s. When I started out, I remember said, I said to my dad, I want to work on environment. And he called all his friends and everyone said, nope, I got no idea what you mean by that. That isn't the case today. Um, environment can help us win elections um, and it's become a battleground for companies to sell their products and also to attract the best people. Uh, We've also seen some significant shifts in some of the, the fundamentals that underpin our economic system. That's also true, uh, for example, in the way in which we produce and distribute energy. 
Uh, ARENA's Global Energy Outlook report for 2020 estimates that by 2050, more than 80% of electricity will be provided by renewables. You can believe that or not, um, they've done their analysis um, and it, it's, it's an important statistic. Central banks around the world are taking another look at their risk frameworks, we know that, um, to better reflect sustainability and this in, in, in impacts on monetary policy and financial regulation. These are systemic, some of the sort of big ticket systemic changes that we need. And the key economies, particularly within the G20, are serious about climate change. Um, I mean, even if that seriousness has yet to be translated and felt in the form of dec decreasing GHG emissions. And, and the, the last two presentations have talked about some of the pathways in which this can, can happen. So this is um, some of the good news. The not so good news is very simple. It's that this transition is taking too long. Uh, those of you who've been watching what's going on in Milan this week, which is the kind of the pre-COP uh, events, will maybe have seen Ms. Thunberg's very helpful little reminder to world leaders, which um, is called her blah, blah, blah speech, where she essentially said, you know, reduce, you know, emissions, blah, 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 build green economy, blah, 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 be circular, blah, blah, blah. She doesn't believe any of us. She doesn't believe um, our generation. And she's not, let's face it, she's not wrong. And it's not unreasonable to have that view if you are 18 um, and if you are engaged in all of these debates. And it's just, it, it's, you know, the, the processes take too long. The policy processes are so slow. We know there's other reasons for that. But I, I, I think that her reminders uh, are helpful to us. So the transition is not fast enough because the science is telling us that we really need to see fundamental changes happening sooner rather than later, by 2030 actually. You know, by 2050, the window is closing. World Resources Institute is telling us that we're currently on track for about three degrees of warming by the end of the century. And the UNFCCC Secretariat's just released a report on NDCs, the National Climate Action Plans, that says very much the same thing. Um, and I mean, there's been talk about, you know, the way that uh, temperature change affects um, different countries and different localities. This is very true. I don't know if three degrees of warming seems a lot to you, but in fact, it would be catastrophic because we're currently at 1.1 and that's an average, right? Um, so, you know, three degrees as an average could translate into very, very significantly higher um, uh, warming in particular localities. And I noticed the 1.8 degrees that you already are in Korea. My children were in Seoul in 2018 and they said, dad, it's really hot here. Um, and I don't, you know, this is, you know, the, the, the new normal. In addition to the smallness of the response, um, when we do actually implement environmental policies, it's also true that they're not always just, and this is where this sort of just transition comes in, because um, impacts can, the impacts of environmental policies are sometimes and quite often, in fact, most negatively affecting the poorest and most vulnerable. Take, for example, reductions in energy subsidies around the world, around fuel and so on. Those impact very heavily uh, on the poorest. Um, and also then in the, in the area of forest management. So, you know, local communities and indigenous peoples are often, you know, worst affected by, by policy change and regulatory change in relation to, to forest resources. So some initial thoughts on, on, on transition and, and, and where we are. And I think at this point, let's try this poll, Julia. Let's see what you think, um, you know, what kinds of ideas are triggered in your mind um, by the term just transition. Let's, let's have a go. And Julia, will you uh, tell us what comes up or, or will I be able to see something? You'll be okay, able to I see. see. Yeah, I should be able to see it. Yeah. So, so let's give it about a minute or so for people. To okay, see. very good. No wrong answers here. Inclusive green growth, moving from linear to circular economy. Sharing economy, indeed. So basically, if someone chooses uh, uh, writing one word in the chat box, basically they just send it, right? 
Yeah, yeah, we, we were going to map it, but I, I think we've not been able to do that. So we're just going to have a quick, quick read through some of these. Transition is basically a process of changing to something that also impacts on society. Okay, transition, we shift to a better world, many terms and conditions. Transition is decision. Certainly right. is. Just transition, progressive change, and it's decisive. Just equals inclusive, indeed. And I think, you know, it, it is, of course, inclusive, but it, it might also be require us to think beyond inclusive to understanding who's been left out, you know, I mean, the when we talk about Agenda 2030, we talk about reaching the furthest first and leaving no one behind. So it, it needs to be inclusive, but it needs to be inclusive of, of those who have historically not been included. Moving from one state to another, low carbon economy, absolutely. Migration from stage to advanced change. Holistic and progressive. Collective action, I like that. Yes, uh, I, it's a pity we can't have a debate, Julia and colleagues, but that, you know, I'd want to know who, who said collect, let's just see. Um, Anjali Colera, yeah, it would be great if you, you know, if you were able to sort of say, well, what it, okay, what does that really mean, collective action? I, I think it, it's right, but it would be, it would be interesting to, to get your sense of what, uh, how you see collective action happening in this space, just transition as participatory inclusive. Transitions are not enough. We need a transformative change to realize our safe and just path. Yes. Progressive changes. Yeah, I think that's, um, you know, we probably haven't got time um, to, to, to carry on much beyond this, Julia, but I think it's very helpful and, you know, some, some very nice ideas there. And, and hopefully Bill helps us to sort of build our, um, our understanding uh, of this, this term. So continuing on, and I, I'm going to sort of wrap up, um, and just find my place. Um, yeah, okay. Right. Let me just make a couple of observations on, on COVID because this has been also mentioned by, by colleagues um, um, on the call. And um, maybe I could have my next slide, um, Julia, which is, should be a graph. Yeah, I hope you can see it. Um, I hope these numbers add up to um, Mushtaq's um, numbers. There may be some divergence. This was a study recently done by Vivid Economics, and we work with them under a program called PAGE, Partnership for Action on Green Economy. But what have we seen in the wake of the economic downturn posed by COVID? We've seen countries introducing stimulus packages, we know that, and these packages have primarily funded things like immediate health needs, short-term income support, assistance to small businesses, and so on. So you could say that these packages, these stimulus packages have been um, quite just, right? Focusing on those who needed most, um, with a particular focus on you know, people out of work and this kind of thing. But the question is, have they also been green um, you know, have we managed to use the stimulus to, um, to, to, to reach this sort of build back better concept? The one that Ms. Thunberg says is all blah, 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 build back better, blah, blah, blah. Well, the answer is yes, a little, but only in some places. And if you look at this graph, um, greenness of the stimulus index, you see there's quite a bit of green above the line, um, but there's more red below the line, um, meaning um, stimulus that was not about building back better um, and which uh, in fact is probably funding business as usual and that rather extractive model which I presented earlier. So the overall analysis says you know about 20% of the overall recovery spending is, is relatively green but that in re relatively few uh, economies. So um, you could say that the evidence of the past year under COVID has not really been a story of just transition, but one more of, of pragmatism, um, the need to do things quickly and essentially using the system that we already have and not really challenging enough. Um, so, you know, 
it's been a just return to business as usual, as opposed for a major opportunity for change. Uh, it's a viewpoint. You may disagree. If you do, please do so and use the chat box. Uh, but you know, let's let's recognise that it's a it's a mixed picture. Um, some countries have done relatively well, and you know, Germany has just been through an election process where the Green Party is quite strong, and and you know, and, and green issues have to some extent and will continue to define um, politics uh, in Germany. And there have been many other developed economies that have, have shown encouraging signs as well, although not particularly the USA yet. Maybe that will come through, um, or Japan, which are both leading economies. But I'm, I'm a hopeful person, so I want to leave you with a couple of very you know, positive pathways that I hope can lead us towards just transition. And the first one is, you know, is this whole issue of circularity. It's about technology and also um, you know, unleashing this incredible ability that we have shown as, 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 as a human species time and time again to reinvent ourselves when the need arises. And we do have solutions. Um, and this whole concept is of circularity uh, is one of them. Uh, I think it's the one that offers the most hope if we can really understand it and unpack it. Um, but it's really, you know, about getting rid of this old linear economy model and, and, and redesigning for a closed loop where the waste from one pro a process becomes the raw material for another, that in very simple terms, there are very lots of different elements to it. But what I like about it is it kind of mimics the natural system. Um, and if you think about it, you know, it's kind of strange to me why it's taken so long for us to realize this. You know, there's, there, I'm, okay, I'm a geographer, right? So I, I, I learned about nutrient cycling and, and the hydrological cycle. There's no waste, right? There's no waste in the nutrient cycle. There's no waste in the hydrological cycle. Um, so how, much, how come there's so much waste in the economic cycle? Well, we know some of the reasons for that. And we know that we need the push and pull factors to change that. But as a model, I think it's, you know, it's elegant and, and offers um, you know, a great hope uh, for the future. The second and final pathway is about people and their aspirations. Um, and here's my final slide, Julia, if you can pop that up. Um, and you know, it, it turns out that consumers want change. It turns out that we've we're not the same people that we were in the hedonistic days of the 1980s and 1990s, thank goodness. Um, you know, it, it, on its own, this is not enough of a lever has already been made and we need regulations and strong incentives and, and, and so on. But it's, it's still an, an extremely um, fundamental and important part of, um, of, of the landscape going, going forward. Um, I mean, I, we were working, somebody mentioned Mongolia earlier. We were working in Mongolia. I was working in Mongolia a few years ago, and there was an IFC study that showed how, you know, in Ulaanbaatar, young people wanted to be able to buy stuff that wasn't damaging the planet. And I just thought that, it, you know, it's reaching every corner of our, of, our, of our system, of our global system. And this is a great driver and hope for the future. So, Alex, colleagues, I'd say that the situation is, is finally poised right now. It's going to take concerted action to ensure that we go the way of just transition rather than business as, as usual. And you know, to echo other speakers, you know, we, we, it's a personal thing. We, we need to be personally involved and not just professionally involved. You know, we can't just be offering advice here and there. You know, it, it, this is a story that needs to include, it includes me and it includes everybody else on this call today, right now. You're all personally implicated. You know, it, it's not, it, it, I can't say fairer than that. We can't leave it for others to decide. So thank you so much for your patience and um, looking forward to some discussion, uh, handing back to you, Julia and Alex. Th thank you. And uh, before Julia takes over, because uh, we still have one last very important thing to do with this webinar. I, I just decided that with your permission, Julia and Ambassador Troy, uh, to take the floor a few seconds to say two things. First, um, sincere, sincere appreciation to the three panelists. Uh, uh, you know, we have organized 80 some webinars uh, since the uh, COVID pandemic started. Uh, I think uh, we started in last March 2020. And uh, you, you get some um, uh, invisible, silent rating of the webinar. This is a, a, an excellent webinar, and I really congratulate you all. You, the three panelists, you are making it possible. The information you share, your comments, your knowledge, your expertise, the motivation you're giving people. So thank you. But the second comment is just to echo uh, dear Angus on one word uh, of all these words that you requested the, the, the participants to give you, which is uh, the person wrote, transition 
is decision. Her name is Anjali Colera. And um, uh, Anjali wrote transition is decision and that's exactly what I wanted to echo. So I, I will finish by leaving this idea with you behind. Transition is decision, but it's not only a decision of the government as you heard, they are participants. Um, uh, government have a role, they have a role, they play a role. This uh, um, climate policy and the push and pull, all what you heard has a place, but in the end, at the very end is a personal decision. That's what I wanted to say is my decision is your decision. Transition is decision. And of course, uh, we encourage you all to be part of the solution because we are already part of the problem. Uh, sorry, Julia, for taking this uh, a little while. Uh, back to you with the last step of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so very much, dear Alex. Thank you, Angus, and all panelists and all participants. Next, we will be watching a video recording from that Sifal Jeju. It is a very interesting one. Um, however, just for your information, it is the duration of the video is about 20 minutes long. And we do um, appreciate your patience and are grateful for you remaining for the rest of the duration so that afterwards we can wrap up. And uh, we will now be sharing the video. Thank you so much. I, I think, uh, Julia, by the way, uh, dear participants, thank you for your patience. Uh, dear Julia, I think you need to share the sound, right? Uh, so we can hear it. And it's quite an interesting video. Thank you, Ambassador Shoy, and, and to your team uh, for, for bringing this up. It's a, a good investment of your time, dear participants. Stay with us till the end, and then we'll have a short wrap up. Um, uh, you can hear it, Julia. You it's can not start. No, you can print the sound settings in your computer. So Today, climate change or climate crisis seem to have taken on a main stage across politics, business, education, economy, and diplomacy. Time and again, climate experts are speaking at an increasing number of conferences and seminars to make us awaken of the urgency of the matter and thus change the pattern of our daily life. In fact, it has become more accessible to listen to what these experts have to say through not only conventional media outlets, but also unconventional and emerging communication channels such as YouTube. However, I can still see so many people, not necessarily an expert, who have continued doing their part to protect the environment and save the earth. They are students, office workers, business owners, and whatnot. What they do for a living does not actually matter when it comes to climate action. They live in not just some countries, but all around the world. Polar regions, low-lying islands, developed and developing countries alike. Wherever you live, Anywhere you live, you can start doing something for the environment. With this belief, Sifar Jeju has met people from various fields in Korea to encourage climate activists out there and motivate more people to join in this global effort. It would be interesting to listen to their individual climate action and what implication it might have at the global level. First, Jeju Island, where Sifar Jeju is located. With a vision to be a carbon-free island by 2030, Jeju has made continuous and conscious efforts to maintain its beautiful ocean, blue sky, and the Hala Mountain. Perhaps based on the Koreans' general admiration of Jeju's nature, Jeju has become a symbolic place that reflects an enhanced level of environmental awareness. Among them, 
There is a brave surfer who has engaged herself in beach cleanup for the last four years. As the head of Save Jeju Bada, a non-profit organization she established, she has raised her voice about the issues of ocean waste and single-use plastic. Please introduce yourself and save Jeju Bada. Hello, um, I'm Ju Young Han, and I'm the founder and CEO of Save Jeju Bada. It's a non-profit organization that fights for clean seas, and we organize beach cleanups and run campaigns to reduce single-use plastic waste. Can you please share with us Save Jeju Bada's activities and its output? I went on a surf trip to Bali in 2014 and it was a monsoon season there and one day it was pouring down and but the surf was good so I was pedaling out and um, all of a sudden a huge patch of garbage appeared out of nowhere and surrounded me and it was something you would see in a nasty trash can like cigarette butts and um, plastic bags that something was still inside and plastic straw and plastic cups and plastic bottles, you know, things like that. And that was the moment that I learned, um, you know, garbage from the land could get into the water, you know, into the sea. And I was shocked and horrified at the same time. And that was um, the eye-opening experience for me. And after I got back to Jeju from that trip, I started uh, noticing ocean trash every time I went surfing or went uh, for a walk around um, Jeju, you know, coastal lines. So I thought, you know, something should be done. You know, someone should do something about it. And then one day, it was um, December 27th of 2017, I thought, you know, I could be that someone, you know. So I created an Instagram account and named Save Jeju Bada and started organizing beach cleanups. Uh, for the first two years, I organized like 67 beach cleanups and with the help from 1,882 volunteers, we were able to get rid of 10 tons of ocean waste and you know, we wanted to contribute to recycling of ocean plastic waste even a little bit. So we started working with TerraCycle Korea and tested some discarded uh, plastic buoys and decided to make camping boxes out of those buoys. Yeah, yeah, since last July, more than 800 people have participated and uh, we are planning to set up another um, beach cleanup center on the west side of Jeju sometime soon so that more people can come and join us. Yeah, I think uh, you can start with observing uh, what type of single-use plastic you use the most and you know try to use less of it or you can change the um, liquid products to solid ones like Instead of buying a liquid shampoo in a plastic bottle, you can buy a shampoo bar, I guess. And also you can reduce your plastic consumption by switching to the alternative products like bamboo toothbrushes like that. So it, it might look small, you know, insignificant, but if we all do it all together, you know, I think we can make a the real change. Like first time, you know, like the, the garbage, ocean garbage surrounded me when I was surfing, right? 
And then I thought like, oh, this is disgusting because, you know, I think this is because, you know, like people here don't have any, you know, concern for the environment, you know, and also they are, Bali, you know, Indonesia is a developing country. Maybe, you know, it's like lack of uh, awareness, you know. And then I uh, got back to Jeju. And then so the same thing is happening here also, you know. It doesn't matter whether it's, you know, developing country or not, you know. Like people uh, buy things and throw things, you know, out of convenience. And, you know, convenience makes, I think, um, trash. Can you please send out a message to our future generation? Yeah, I want to say that, like, clean stage starts start with us and if we all pick up at least one piece of trash and try to reduce as much trash as possible i think we all can make the change make the change uh, we want to see in the world yeah. uh, i want to share and give them like positive energy and positive message that they you know, they can envision, you know, themselves for themselves. Now it feels natural to describe Seoul as an international city since Seoul has 380,000 foreign residents. I wonder how Korea's environment would look like to their eyes and why some of them are taking part in climate activity in Seoul, which is not even their home country or home city. Based on this thought, I met Julian Quintart from Belgium, who is actually quite well known for most of the Koreans, and listened to his thoughts on the environment. Uh, hello everybody, pleasure to meet you. I'm Julian Quintart. Uh, it's been 18 years I live in Korea now. Um, I mainly do entertainment here, so I'm well known for a show called Nun Summit that was very popular in Korea, where we had different representatives of uh, different countries talking about a very wide range of subjects. Uh, it's actually on Netflix, so if you want to see it, you, you might be able to, to check it out. And I was the Belgian representative there. Um, for all my life in Korea, it's been more than 17 years I live in Seoul now. And it's always been very important for me uh, to talk a bit about environment matters. And so I'm very happy today for you to uh, ask for this interview and uh, be able to talk with you, with you. Pleasure to meet you. Hello. How have you become interested in acting for the environment? I think for me, uh, there's always something that's been like guiding me through everything. And it's been uh, a kind of sense of uh, some environment um, uh, responsibility, uh, like self-responsibility. So s even though while I was here, I always tried to ride my bike. Uh, and for me, like there's always been some uh, desire and like I think inner need to kind of try to do something. And so that's why uh, I guess uh, this year, especially, I really decided to get myself way more involved into this and I really want to focus on trying to make a change for, uh, for climate change <laughs> in the good way. Tell us more about the so-called climate blue. There's something very uh, common among people that care about the environment. It's called in Korea like 환경 우울증. Is a lot of people like feel they're alone in this fight and they get really sad and a bit they got the environment blues like this in Korea. And I feel like for me what really helped me get through this uh, climate blues was people because I think you have to realize that you're not in to this just yourself. Community, feeling connection with people is really what get me like the strength and and get me out of the booth. We're not in together, there's so many people that care. 
I understand that you have recently decided to go vegan. The meat we're eating is not healthy meat, and it's really bad for the environment. If ever everybody like just you know once a week, at least starting like that, you know like meatless day. There's this movement called Meatless Monday, you know, and in in Ghent also we in Belgium uh, on Thursday they have no meat at school. There's a movement like that, and for me this is one of the biggest things I think we should all try to do because this has the biggest impact because we can get so much land back and from that land we can grow back forest and there's so many things we could do back with the environment and so many destruction comes from actually this, so many forest destruction comes from that and water pollution also number one cause of water pollution. It is the meat industry so yeah so I think we have to fight every way like but at the end, what is the most important, I think is not trying to be perfect and, and hurt yourself. You're just trying every day to grow a bit, understand more, talk to people. Because I think like, as an individual, you cannot be perfect. And if ever you're 90% perfect, you're amazing. And the 10%, you don't need to do it yourself. Get someone else to do the 10% for you. And then that person will maybe go 80%. And so what have you done? You didn't do 100%, you did 150%, 180%. And then that person maybe will get someone else to do something. And then you're going to like 1000% of impact from the environment. And I think that's really the key at the end to change really, to get a big impact on climate is individual trying to influence other individuals to do better things for the environment. And through that we can get companies and government to actually really care. Do you have a message to send out to our future generation? We all have our voices and when all our voices get together, we get really loud. And our everyday action might be very quiet, but when they bring together, they really make a change. Indeed, some of the climate actions like reducing meat consumption, picking up trash on the street and using less plastics are observable. Perhaps there are other climate actions that are more subliminal and less apparent. The most pressing issue of a time often becomes a subject of literature and modern art. Then how is the climate crisis interpreted in the words of artists? As more and more books on climate change are published these days, I found a fiction called Love in the Time of Climate Change. It is a book of 10 short stories of different living creatures building relationships in different climate scenarios. I met the writer of the book, Kim Gi Chang, to ask what message he would hope to send out to. I Kim Gi Chang. I am a writer of Monaco and Bangkok. 근래에 그 기후 변화, 기후 위기를 소재로 총 10편의 단편을 담은 기후 변화 시대의 사랑이라는 책을 편했습니다. 네, 반갑습니다. 반갑습니다. What message did you want to deliver through the stories in your book? 제가 그 소설 배경을 다양한 국가나 그리고 인류뿐만이 아니라 어떤 다른 생명체 그리고 여러 민족을 다루려고 했던 이유가 그 기후 위기가 얼마만큼 전 세계적으로 영향을 끼치는지를 보여주고자 해서 설정을 다양하게 가져왔어요. 그리고 실제로 미디어 등 과학자들의 경고는 기후 위기가 찾아왔을 때 가장 큰 피해를 보는 사람들 혹은 생명체는 사회적 약자, 사회적 약자의 동물도 들어가겠죠. 그런 사람들이 가장 큰 피해를 겪을 것이라고 생각을 했, 이야기를 했고. 그래서 저도 좀 생각을 해봤죠. 어떤 사회적 약자들이 있을까? 기후 위기에 피해를 입는. 그러다 보니까 국적이든 뭐 지역이든 좀더 다양하게 사람들을 생각할 수 있었던 것 같아요. 그래서 그걸 이야기에 담으려고 노력을 했고 그게 총 10편의 단편이라는 소설로 결과물로 나타나게 된것 같아요.
제일 중점으로 뒀던 거는 그거 같아요. 그 기후 불평등 문제. 그러니까 불평등하고 기후 위기하고는 뗄래야 될수 없다라고 생각을 했고, 그러면 누구의 시각에서 이 글을 전개해 나갈 것이냐 하면 기후 위기로 가장 큰 고통을 겪는 사람들 입장에서 이야기를 전개해 나가려고 했거든요. 그게 이제 뭐 북극에 사는 생명체일 수도 있고, 그리고 돔시티에서는 그 사회적 약자들의 입장에서 이 기후 위기를 바라보는 것. 그리고 기후 위기가 심각해지면 지금 현재 불평등이 더 심각해진다라는 것. 그렇게 되면 공동체 전체가 와야 될 수밖에 없다라는 것. 그런 부분들이 중요한 것 같아요. How is climate change reflected in literature and art? 꼭 기후 위기뿐만이 아니라 환경이라는 큰 주제 아래, 테마 아래 소설들이 많이 쓰여지는 것 같아요. 자기 삶에 있어서 그 환경을 좀더 보호하는 차원에서 했던 소소한 그 행동들이 있잖아요. 뭐 예를 들면 전기를 아껴 쓴다든지 뭐 플라스틱을 덜 사용한다든지 그런 실천들은 조금씩 늘어나고 있고 그게 뭐 일상생활에 늘어나면 당연히 뭐 문학예술 분야에서도 그거와 관련된 이야기들이 앞으로 점점 더 많이 나오지 않을까 사실 예술의 존재 이유는 뭐 여러 가지가 있겠지만 공감이 가장 큰또 예술의 역할이라고 생각을 하거든요. 그러니까 내가 기존에 관심 없던 것이나 그리고 뭐 그런 관심 없던 것 중에는 하나는 뭐 타인의 고통이겠죠. 그 타인에는 뭐 인간도 포함될 수 있고 타자라고 하면 좋겠네요. 나무든 동물이든 그 타자의 고통에 공감하게끔 하는 게 예술이 중요한. 역할인데 음, 그런 부분에 있어서 예술이 할수 있는 일이 아직도 굉장히 많겠죠. What would you suggest we do to address the climate crisis? 이런 그 국가의 정책하고 그리고 개인의 각성이 맞물려 돌아갔을 때 기후 위기를 좀 벗어나 수가 있다고 생각을 하는데 어떤 일방적으로 정책만 있으면 절대 이게 성공할 수가 없거든요. 그러다 보니 그 어떤 기후 위기에 대한 교육이 계속해도 이루어져야 계속 분들에게도 좀 이루어져야 하고 사실 근데 계속뿐만이 어, 아니라 전반적으로 다 그런 어떤 지속 가능한 생존이라는 전제 하에 그를 위해서 필요한 여러 가지 저의 생활의 변화나. 그런 시스템의 변화, 구조의 변화들에 대해서 교육 계속 이루어져야 된다고 봐요. 음, 사람들은 조금씩 준비가 되어가고 있긴 한것 같아요. 그 이게 문제가 된다라는 생각을 조금씩 하고 있어서 그 긍정적으로 볼수 있는 부분도 뭐 없지 않아 있다 이렇게 생각이 좀 들긴 하네요. 아이들이 자연스럽게 그 환경 문제를 인식하고 있고 그래서 오히려 목소리 더큰것 같아요. 자기들이 앞으로 살아갈 시대, 그러니까 세대가 아직 저희보다 훨씬 많은 나라 세월을 살아야 되니까 그 시대를 고민을 하고 있고 환경 문제에 대해서. I did not know that there are many people out there who try to prove that they can do something despite the inconvenience that may follow. They all have a positive attitude towards the future, believing that we all can make a difference. Their persistent and tenacious climate efforts were impressive and encouraging. Hopefully, their voices and messages can spread out to the other parts of the world. 여러분들은 어, 나무나 동물들처럼 자연 환경까지 함께 공존해 나간다는 생각으로 기후 위기를 막기 위한 실천들을. 해나갔으면 좋겠습니다. 네. Yeah, I want to unite people with like positive message, positive like future, you know, like uh, something we I want to see and something that lift lift all up, you know, like something uplifting um, story, you know, message. Yeah, that that's what I want to share with people. So what about we join our voices together? 
and the sound of action together and get louder to make a change for climate change. Well, thank you very, very much for watching that. Uh, congratulations, outstanding video that has been produced. Um, uh, Julia, thank you for um, hosting the part of the panel that you hosted. And before we go, um, I was uh, taking my notes, Ambassador Choi, and I simply wanted to tell you that I am so impressed with this video and the ability to communicate and to relate. There are many videos and similar messages and so on, but this is unique. And I'll, I'll tell you bilaterally why, that uh, I simply wanted to invite you publicly. I, I, I thought about doing it by email and I will send you an email, but I wanna invite you publicly to uh, launch this video here in Geneva, the Palais de Nacional, the headquarters of the United Nations uh, in Europe, because I think the message is so powerful. And with that, uh, I would like to also thank again uh, my colleague Angus, who just had to leave because he had a, another event, but also Professor Sun Wu and uh, Dr. Memon. Um, it has been a trifecta, as they say, of uh, excellent uh, perspectives coming together towards the same goal. And to you, Ms. Kim, all of this happened because of you. <laughs> you know, it's not, not a Basel Choi or, or Alex, your friend who are uh, doing this thing, is Ms. Kim and Julia. Uh, Miss Julia again. Um, uh, with that, let me give you Ambassador Cho one last last word uh, so we can close uh, properly. If you would like to say farewell, Ambassador Cho, you have the floor. Thank you. I sincerely hope that uh, everybody enjoy uh, the video. <laughs> I thank you very much to all uh, for your uh, participation in the webinar. I hope that we have very uh, fruitful and meaningful time here. Uh, and then I, I, I hope that we come back again uh, with uh, another wonderful uh, program. Uh, 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 that's all I, I want to say at this moment. And I wish you, uh, I wish you all, all the best. Thank you. Thank you all. We wish you a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you.